Hello, dear viewers. Welcome back for the final panel discussion during Formnext Digital Days. Additive manufacturing is not always about 3D printing the final application, but also sometimes about how 3D printing makes certain applications possible in the first place. In this panel discussion, we are going into completely different areas of successful plastic application using additive manufacturing. We want to talk about tooling. We want to talk about sustainable materials, and we want to talk about the break-even point when it comes to volume production. In short, we want to look at 3D printing and its benefits in plastic applications. Sasha, one last time we'll go into a panel discussion. Uh, we'll be looking at our topic from three completely different angles. What do you expect from today's panel? Thanks, Sven, and hello, dear panelists. Yeah, I already feel a little pity that we will not have <laughs> our co-moderation uh, model continuing for quite a while. But uh, as you said it, uh, when talking about polymers, we all know that uh, polymers uh, will be a very important part or plays a very important part, not only in the industry, not only in additive manufacturing, but uh, uh, in all uh, modern communities. It's nearly impossible to completely live without polymers. So it's really a question how to use uh, polymer technology and uh, additive manufacturing with polymers in a quite intelligent way, combining these angles you, you just talked about. So therefore, I'm really exciting how we bring these different points and these different angles uh, together to one central message and discussion. That's what I'm looking for. And uh, to everybody out there in the audience, please don't forget the panelists are also here to answer your questions, so please frequently use the Slido function to keep on running a very vivid discussion. Thank you so much, Dasha, for the introduction. Brings me to our panelists for the final panel discussion about uh, successful polymer applications. Uh, the first panelist I want to welcome on stage is Jason Murphy with the most complicated uh, company name I ever heard, Jason. But I try. You are president and CEO of NXCMFG. I hope that's correct. And yes. uh, then we have Daniel Petzold, Research Associate at University of Bayreuth. And last but not least, Deepak Venkada Traman. Sorry, Deepak. It's quite a difficult last name. Technical leader of 3D printing business segment at NatureWorks. Hello, everyone here at this panel. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank Jason, you. Great to be here. <laughs> Jason, no. starting with you. I remember our briefing discussion, and, and that was the first thing coming to my mind. So you are really stretching the limits on plastic part production with great innovations. And even though you don't print with plastics at all. So what does this have to do with 3D printing and what exactly are you doing? Sure. Well, thank you, Sven, and thank, hello to everyone. I uh, appreciate the time. Uh, so even though we don't actually print in plastic here, we actually 3D print in metal. But what we do print is the tooling that's used in high volume injection molding. And what this does is because we can print it, we can add features into the mold uh, or dye that typically would not be achievable through conventional machining. So when we 3D print the mold in metal, that gives us uh, superior surface finishes and ability to cool the plastic much faster, which is the biggest part of a cycle time of polymer conversion. So this is something on high volume, uh, very critical parts is very important because what it does is it reduces that cycle time. It also eliminates a lot of defects because one thing unique to next chapter manufacturing is, is that we can change the density of steel to be porous at a microscopic level. This allows the gas and the venting out uh, so what this does is produce better cosmetic parts. So these are a couple areas where we're focused on using metal additive to have a successful impact in polymer conversion for high volume uh, plastic production. So to summarize that, that means you decrease uh, the time of production, right? 
And right. basically, you, you improve the, the out of the mold coming product. That means you reduce the amount of post production. Is that correct? Yeah. So scrap is reduced, which is, you know, very, uh, very important these days to uh, when, you know, especially with uh, things on force majeure and, and uh, materials being in short supply and supply chains being disrupted, you need to get the most parts and most production out of your uh, polymer that you do have in stock. So being able to reduce your scrap by 10, 15% means you're going to make 10, 15% more products good going to the customer, which means better profitability. We come later to the cost part of it, because this means in conclusion that the cost per part is decreasing, but we will uh, sure. definitely come to that topic later. So Deepak, when you work for a company called NatureWorks, don't get me wrong, but this is a question you get, yeah? Everyone who hears that automatically assumes that it has something to do with sustainability. Plastic and sustainability, how does that work together? Yeah, that's a that's a fair enough question, Sven. Um, <laughs> so maybe real quick for uh, people that may not be aware, NatureWorks is a leading supplier of a bio-based uh, resin called PLA or polylactic acid. I think a lot of the uh, users in the AM space are probably familiar with that resin. Um, and sustainability for us kind of plays into everything that we basically do at NatureWorks. So, for example, if you start with our Uh, feedstocks even. Uh, we use plant sugars that are fermented to make um, our polymer. And being based in North America, the, the cheapest source of plant sugars, specifically dextrose, uh, comes from field corn crop. Um, and so, you know, the, uh, the process that we use to extract the, the corn um, and the manufacturing process to make the uh, PLA polymer um, all have some critical components of sustainability in it. So when we uh, start with the field cone, it's not just that it's based on a, uh, you know, a, a renewable resource that's uh, you know, annually regrown again. Really what it's doing is taking, the plants really are taking atmospheric CO2 and kind of locking it into these sugar molecules within the structure of the plant. Um, basically sequestering a greenhouse gas into that plant and then transforming that to sugars, dextrose, which is what we take, uh, ferment it to lactic acid and then polymerize to make the PLA. And that manufacturing process, um, you know, it's, it, it really affords us to, to yield a, a polymer that has very desirable uh, uh, eco profiles and uh, LCA, so life cycle assessment um, metrics. For example, through that manufacturing process, we are able to produce a polymer that per kilogram compared to other fossil fuels use up about um, 50% lower renewable energy costs and produce in the ballpark of um, you know, 80% lower greenhouse gases compared to you know, fossil-based alternates. So uh, there's that portion of, of the manufacturing, but we even take it a step further with our feedstock um, it's not just you know, field corn based. The corn that we use has actually been certified um, as having sustainable agricultural practices as well. And it's, it's a third party certification that we get from a body called uh, the In International Sustainability and Carbon uh, Certification. And I believe it's based in Germany as well. And so this is an ex external third party body that has you know, a list of clearly defined requirements that farmers and growers have to meet in order for them to be considered uh, growing their crop in sustainable, uh, using sustainable practices. And so, you know, there's feedstock, there's manufacturing, and then when we get to the application of uh, where NGO PLA is used, it's, it's a pretty wide portfolio, but in this case, 3D printing, um, You know, everybody that has used a desktop printer typically knows the printability and the interlayer adhesion of that PLA brings and how that kind of translates to, um, you know, uh, fewer warped parts, fewer failed parts. On a desktop printer, you know, maybe the, um, the amount of material that you lose to a failed part is not a lot, but when you think about large format printing, um, you know, these huge volumes of parts that are made, 
when you have a material that has um, you know, the reliable print performance that PLA does in these large format prints, you really have now an option to use a material with uh, sustainable credentials, uh, you know, a very desirable eco profile, and then marry that with performance during printing uh, to yield an option where you don't have a lot of material loss or a lot of uh, energy loss due to failed prints um, or failed parts. Very good, very good. So we will definitely come back on the quality of the material in the end product. And uh, what about recircular economy? Um, but let's first uh, introduce Daniel. Daniel, you see two exciting people from very different backgrounds. Uh, so what are you dealing with at your work at uh, Uni Bayreuth? And how much does it have to do with successful application with polymers? Yeah, hello, everybody from my side in the audience. I'm very happy to be the part of the Form Next Digital Days and discuss with you guys uh, the successful polymer applications. I think uh, we create a good new format uh, to give us all new impressions and encourage for the exchange that we can learn more for, from each other. Um, we at the University of Bayreuth um, on the chair of manufacturing and remanufacturing uh, got great possibilities to doing research in the field of AM. So we have different technologies in our lab. So we have laser beam melting, material extrusion, uh, stereo lithography, or high-speed sintering. And um, we can see from all different angles on these technologies, and we can um, do work with everything we like. Um, I am working in the field of high-speed sintering, and the technology offers great uh, material properties by a really high productivity. To give you understanding of successful applications with polymers, we are working on functional gradient materials. So we can, um, um, for the uh, dual products for the orthopedics, and so in orthopedics, you need uh, products which are personalized. So we can control in high-speed sintering the energy input through gray scaling. So we define how hard the material should be. And therefore, we can combine it with structures. And so we nearly have endless possibilities to help uh, people. And this offers us new um, possibilities in the field of AM. So we want um, to make it successful that the technology will grow bigger and bigger. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so Divak, you just uh, strived a little bit what you can do with the material. Um, the, the first thing that came into my mind, if, if plastic can be biodegradable, and this is, I think, what, what your material is, why don't we go ahead and just use your plastic for everything and anything? Yeah, well, I think our sales team would really love that, Sven, but we can't make it too easy for them. Um, and I tell, you, I tell you, Jason will help you. That's for sure. Yes. Yeah, but uh, yeah, when you bring up biodegradation, we kind of see that as one component um, of the uh, composting uh, end of life option. So um, it is a compostable biopolymer and composting is a great end of life option for certain applications. So think of your food service wear applications, your uh, cups, bowls, um, knives, uh, your uh, chip bags, for example. You know, once you're done using it, um, it's a great option to use um, PLA and NGO PLA in particular to um, you know, make, make the containers out of it so that it creates a food diversion from away from the landfills. So in, in, in that space, it's a great uh, end of life option. For 3D printing, um, I think the better option would be either mechanical recycling or chemical recycling even. So mechanical recy recycling would be something I think that's already pretty prevalent in this market where, you know, people are taking their scrap filament, their they fail parts, um, you know, regrinding it and bringing it back into the process and, and mixing it with virgin resin um, and really reusing it right there. Um, 
you know, an example is uh, we work with a partner company called Flow. They basically use uh, our resin to make coffee capsules. And so when they thermoform the coffee capsules, you have a lot of edge trim um, and, you know, um, portions of the uh, sheet that aren't used. And so they basically have taken that, reground it up and actually made custom, custom designed 3D printed furniture for uh, um, conferences and trade shows like, you know, like what you would see at Foam Next. So that everything from the tabletop to stools to the chairs that they have in there have all been custom 3D printed with the scrap material. So, you know, it's already being done. Um, mechanical recycling. Chemical recycling with PLA is another great option because it is a single monomer. So when you hydrolyze it back to its uh, starting monomer, you're just left with lactic acid compared to some of the other polymers out there like ABS or PET, for example, you do have to deal with uh, multiple monomers that make up that polymer. Uh, with lactic acid, it is a pretty simple, simple process to bring it back um, to its starting constituent, which is lactic acid. And then you can use that uh, in various downstream processes or, you know, go through the repolymerization step again to make a PLA. So if I understand correctly, recycling it is not that easy. Um, and it's, I guess it's super cost intensive, right? Um, so on, on paper, recycling it is relatively easy. Um, you know, one of the biggest, I think, hindrances to that, I would say, is the economies of scale and the infrastructure not being, you know, quite where it should be. And that's, I think, typical, I would say, of any plastic, not just a PLA or, or another biopolymer that might be used in the field. Okay. Um, we have a question from the audience. I know we just heard Deepak, but it's for him. So probably we add this question because it's actually fitting very well, Sasha. Yep. So, uh, Deepak, is the biomaterial not only biodegradable, but also certified for certain applications or ready to be so? Just think of medical degree material made for one-time use. Sure. Um, so, the, the grades of uh, PLA that we manufacture uh, don't get used for medical grade applications. And when I say medical grade, I, I mean um, in, in vivo type applications. Um, so in theory, PLA is used in those applications as copolymers, but it isn't uh, the grades that NatureWorks produces. Okay. Okay, question to Daniel, because we, we just were talking about the economics of the whole thing. Um, so we always quick, to compare the economics of additive manufacturing with formative manufacturing. And uh, it's, it's also been done in LCAs, et cetera. So are there any applications where additive manufacturing clearly outperforms? So especially with regard to plastics uh, that you know? For additive manufacturing, you need always a new feature to create a really high value part. Mm -hmm. So the performance in manufacturing prototypes is in my opinion, state of the art. The timeline to hold a part in your hand is amazing. With the developing of new technologies are more and more in the, we are more and more in the area of the serious production. The formative manufacturing, you have more steps to do before you have the part. In AM, we have a digital process chain where we can manufacture it directly out of the design programs. So we do not have like tools or a form. AM clearly outperforms in small lot sizes and for personalized, especially medical products. The work costs for these products are very high and the use of different materials, which I have to fit to the product to create no waste and the integration of sensor to track the health of the person and the progress of healing is a new field we can open. So there's definitely a way where we can, where additive manufacturing will be the future for production. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, 
as I understood correctly, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of scale, Jason. I mean, you're working for the uh, injection molding industry. So there I know, at least from my experience, you need a certain number. Be, before that, it doesn't make sense at all to use that. Um, leads me to the, brings me to the question, how much can additive manufacturing still contribute to the optimization of plastic injection molding? And will the moment come when only additive manufacturing is used? That would be your main question. But probably you can add where you see the break even between the two technologies in plastic. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great question, and and we've been trying to figure that out in the additive world for for the last few years. And I think one thing that we see is that 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 shift is happening more and more rapidly through the uh, you know through the pandemic. Uh, we see where we've gotten, you know, production scale on a on a small scale, but again, as Daniel said, very rapid response. You know, we can go right from the CAD model right to the part very quickly. So we don't have this long lead times for tooling. So that's an area where we gain a lot of time. We gain a lot of efficiency uh, for high volume. You know, you're talking millions, tens of millions of parts. Uh, tooling is still going to be the the way to go. Um, but what we do see is, is additive is gaining exponentially. So um, if you look at, you know, what's happened in semiconductor uh, and processing speeds, you know, now it's, it, it increased, you know, and doubled um, every few years. And, and now, you know, it's, again, almost irrelevant because it's, there's so much capacity there. The, I think the same is going to happen on a, a maybe a little bit different pace, but still at an exponential pace with additive where we see, you know, going into the tens of thousands of parts or um, uh, thousands of parts, maybe for specialty. So something like in the metal world, um, you know, speed is, is increasing, but uh, the other thing that also needs to increase is surface finishes. And what we see in additive is the surface finishes are amazing. I mean, it's really phenomenal what's happening with surface finishes. Uh, the, the speeds are there and also with materials. So we see, again, an expansive movement in materials. So I think this shift is going to continue to happen at an exponential rate. And in the next, you know, three to five years, we'll see low volume production shifting to additive uh, high volume will still be done with uh, tooling. However, right now we're this is where we're disrupting the market through uh, using additive and 3D printing of tooling to get there in half the amount of lead time to build <coughs> the tooling, reducing the cost. Now, once we're in production because of the cycle time reduction, we're actually able to reduce that cycle time down by 80, uh, 20 to 80 percent on average is what we see in reduction. So now once you build that mold, that mold is going to produce parts uh, considerably faster than conventional machining. So there is a lot of things that additive is, is moving towards for both high volume as well as low volume and that mix in between. But I think the other thing too that we see the biggest trend as well is, uh, is on the area of customization. So yeah. again, we know that in this world and in this economy that um, one size does not fit all. So customers want that uniqueness. They want that ability uh, to have something fit to them. So the, the fact that additive gives that flexibility to give that customization is is also very key that something with traditional injection molding or manufacturing does not give you that flexibility so i think the the shift is happening but also there's other factors that are happening with flexibility that really make it interesting for the consumer <laughs> thank you for that for that answer so coming to customization daniel um I'm I'm really into automotive industry, and if if I look at the current development in terms of electric mobility, then we really talk about cars. In my opinion, that's going to be that going to be used like three years max. So th this will be the future cycle time because technology is running that fast, and we we have probably will experience uh, much smaller series. So. Um, is it imaginable that we have like uh, additive applications for interior parts, for example, that are 
basically always have been injection molding in the automotive industry that are changing to additive due to the smaller size of uh, production series? It's a funny thing. We already have uh, parts which are additive manufactured, uh, additive manufactured in the interior of the cars. So um, I think um, what people want in the cars is uh, the feeling, the design. So it always depends on the concept you are doing or you want to do in the car. If you want to um, have uh, high high materials, you always will use metal and maybe wood in cars to get the, the ambient. So I think um, what, what has to be done in additive manufacturing is to have new materials. So because the new materials will accelerate the use of AM. So um, like you see in the last three years, there are so many uh, material grades we didn't have the years before. And so many new options like conductivity with 3D printing. So um, I, I know that in new cars are 3D printed uh, parts which for, for light. So um, it's, it's growing on, and with new materials, new options will be there and we can use it or we will use it. New materials, Deepak. Can you quickly um, present or go a little bit into detail the project we were talking about in the briefing about the packaging part that your material is used to? And additionally, second, second part of the question would be, um, can you imagine your material, especially in the sector we were just talking about, like interior parts, probably not visible interior parts in automotive? Sure. Um... So, man, I think the, uh, the example that we were talking about was one that um, Cincinnati Incorporated had, had I think, packaging uh, one, yeah. done the actual printing of it. Um, but it was a custom, custom printed, uh, uh, basically shipping and packaging uh, form that you would use to transport, um, you know, very fragile components. And in this case, it was a component for a, a windmill application, so windmill turbine. Uh, they wanted to transport it, I think, by road. And you know, the typical option would be to put it into a crate and stuff it with, hopefully, enough uh, uh, styrofoam peanuts, for example, and uh, yeah. cross your fingers and hope that it makes it to its destination without any damage. But uh, you know, this group was able to actually custom print a form that they then set into the crate and then had the component neatly fit into it. And the advantage was uh, they, you know, using additive manufacturing, they could easily um, create a form that fit exactly to the uh, component that was shipped. Um, and not only that, they were also able to lightweight that uh, form uh, by forming it during printing. And so you have this very functional, very custom made, um, very easily, uh, relatively speaking, easily um, delivered product that you can, you can now use, um, you know, in, in uh, common shipping uh, applications. Great. And, and second question. So that would be then after I use it, I can just throw it away because I don't need to think about it, if I understand correctly, right? Without any well, bad feelings. Well, well. Well, hopefully you, you hopefully you would be able to use it. That would be ideal um, instead of throwing it away. Um, but recycle again would be another option for that, where you can maybe try and find a way to grind it and bring it back uh, into the process and kind of keep it into that in that circular economy um, framework. And and getting back to automotive is is that a field where you could imagine your material to be used? Um, so. Automotive, uh, definitely certain applications, um, PLA has already been used in. Uh, so the plastic in a commercial form has been around for, I'd say about 25 years now. And maybe the early applications were um, actually aut automotive applications that uh, at the time Toyota had done. Um, so it's already been used in, in certain um, uh, areas of the car. And I think the next wave definitely possible to explore looking at 
even under hood applications with the amount of uh, technology and the um, additives that have kind of developed uh, over the past, uh, I'd say, a couple decades for PLA. Um, thank you so much for the answer. And I'm seeing a question from a former panelist from yesterday. Yo, thank you for the question. Sasha, what is the question about? Yep. It's about material extrusion. So at this year's Form Next, I saw more material extrusion related companies exhibiting than I had expected. What are your thoughts on the positive aspects and future potential of material extrusion technology? I am also a main user of material extrusion. Question I think going to Jason. Rather to Daniel, right? Oh, Daniel? Daniel? Yeah, um, material extrusion is uh, the material, uh, the uh, amount of materials we have uh, already to use are growing more and more. The machines are going faster, so the technology is moving forward. So we can combine a good surface with a um, the volume inside, so we nearly get everything we want. And the technology um, is a free technology, so it's going really cheap. And that's why it will be more and more used in the future. And the parts, um, you can use fibers in it, for example, so you can uh, strengthen it like you want. So I think uh, material extrusion uh, will grow more and more but the other um, technologies also will uh, be better and they will have um, their use in, in other fields. Great, thank you so much. It is a pity, honestly, guys, I, I must admit, we are, we are running out of time, so I have to do the closing, but uh, I'm, I'm super happy what, with what happened and the full thank you and uh, appreciation goes to you because uh, your fruitful content uh, delivers exactly uh, the 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 thing I was expecting because we got a broad range of aspects and perspectives here. Thank you so much for being our guest in the panel. Thank you, Sasha, for supporting and and delivering the questions on time. Uh, thank you so much, all of you. This was the panel about successful polymer application. I wish you all the success for the future. Looking forward to see you all again in network with you. And this is the invitation for the audience. These three guys can be addressed at any time via our networking platform. So make heavily use of that. And we will proceed with our program. And I say thank you and goodbye to the participants. Thank you. See you, see you soon. Bye-bye.